Well, um, we are in a series called, as Tom introduced to you, Like a Child. <clears throat> Remember that Jesus said to allow the little children to come unto me. And he said, as such is the kingdom of God. And, and children say some, uh, many of you have got little bitty kids and they're just starting, you're talking to them about God. And they're just starting to ask those questions that you wish that somebody else could answer. Don't call me up. I can't give you any real wisdom here. You're going to have to learn that yourself as to how to, to deal with this. But kids have some real provocative questions. And they have some real insights because they're, you know, they, they don't have all the pat answers down that we will just assume and they'll they'll struggle with it and and what we're looking at is that this, the same kind of questions that the kids have are the questions that we continue to have you know the same kind of things we struggle with and today our, our note to God comes from a little guy named Larry he says dear God maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each so much if they had their own rooms it works with my brother it's cute isn't it so what we all need is just another room. We need some space. And, and really what he's talking about, you know, is that the story of Cain and Abel, as he probably was taught that in Sunday school class that day and went home, was trying to figure this whole thing out, how to make this better, is the problem of evil in our world, the, the problem of, of pain and suffering. And, and, and these are things, I mean, it's, it's just so common today. Why is there evil? If God is good and God is powerful, then, then why not make the world a place where there's no hate, there's no evil, there's no injustice, and little kids want to know, and adults want to know too. It may not be foremost on our minds this morning, but you know we, we live in a world uh, that God created, and what we find for many is that it's not a very happy place. Um, not everyone, you know, like Larry, gets another bedroom. Most people, there are millions of children in our world that don't even have beds, as we, you know, are here this morning, much less a second bedroom. And if we look at the news every day, what we see constantly is uh, stuff about wars and terrorisms and terrorism and riots and, and the national news we see, you know, no matter which party is in office. We see scandals and payoffs and lies and bribes and, and then there's, you know, tornadoes and, and stuff that just kind of happens indiscriminately to people and, and just wipes out entire towns and, and we look at the local news and there's shootings and there's uh, fires and abuse and, and arson and scandals and are you depressed yet and fraud and embezzlement and all that. That's what we've gotten used to in the news. And we can't deny that there's evil in this world. Something's wrong. It shouldn't be this way. People are suffering. And so we, we wonder, well, how did things get so messed up? And the reason is, it's a real simple reason, but it's not a reason that's often given. The reason is, is because we've all sinned. And when we sin, it brings evil into the world. See, sin is, is any attitude or any action against God. Just general category. But any action, any attitude against God. And sin started, of course, we know with that first couple, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In fact, it said that sin came into the world because of what one man did, that is Adam, and with sin came death. That's what Paul said in Romans 5.12. And you know that story. Uh, everybody knows that story. Um, we remember that story about the tree and the serpent and the fruit and the temptation and the sin. And we call that the fall of humanity. And I'm not going to read that again today. We're not going to go through that story. Instead, what we're going to do is to consider the extension of that story, the extension of what happened there into the family of Adam and Eve, you see, after the first couple sinned, um, and their sin was trying to elevate themselves to the place of God, to take God's place, to the level of God, God kicked them out of the garden. Things had changed, and the entire world had changed, and all creation had changed, including, including the very nature of the man and the woman. And so now they're living outside the garden, and they have two boys. And the story of what happens to those two brothers is one of the most tragic stories ever told, really. And it also shows us the condition of the world. So here we go, Genesis 4, 1 through 15. 
The man Adam knew his wife Eve intimately. She became pregnant, gave birth to Cain, and said, I've given life to a man with the Lord's help. She gave birth a second time to Cain's brother Abel. Abel cared for the flocks, and Cain farmed the fertile land. Sometime later, Cain presented an offering to the Lord from the land's crops, while Abel presented his flock's oldest offspring with their fat. The Lord looked favorably on Abel and his sacrifice, but didn't look favorably on Cain and his sacrifice. Cain began, became very angry and looked resentful. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why do you look so resentful? If you do the right thing, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do the right thing, sin will be waiting at the door, ready to strike. It will entice you, but you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, Where's your brother Abel? Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's guardian? The Lord said, What did you do? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You are now cursed from the ground that opened its mouth to take your brother's blood from your hand. When you farm the fertile land, it will no longer grow anything for you, and you will become a roving nomad on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Now that you've driven me away from the fertile land and I am hidden from your presence, I'm about to become a roving nomad on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, It won't happen. Anyone who kills Cain will be paid back seven times. The Lord put a sign on Cain so that no one who found him would assault him. It's a sad story, really. Brother kills a brother over God. It's still happening. One is dead, the other one is banished. And Adam and Eve, they really can't blame anyone else but themselves because it's their sin, you said, that changed the world. Do you know what it's like to see your child imitate your own sinful behavior? If you haven't had that experience yet, you will. There will come a time when you see your child do the same thing that you've done. And you'll try to explain to them, no, no, children don't do that, only adults do that. It's okay for mommy to tell a little white lie, but you can't tell any kind of a lie whatsoever. But inside you're going, oh no, he's becoming me. What are we going to do? We need to get somebody to straighten this boy out. One of the most sickening feelings you can have. But our sin infects them. Uh, we call it generational sin, where the sins of the father and the mother are passed on from generation to generation. And this evil in our world is caused by sin, by its nature. That is, we are born selfish. We are born rebellious. And it's also environmental. We learn how to hate from others, from parents and others. But now let me add in here as well that the opposite is also true. You can break generational sin, and you can teach children how to behave after the Lord. And you can undo what you've done there with God's help. So let's not dwell just on the negative. But sin is a universal problem. Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. We know those scriptures. No one's perfect. No one's pure. I don't measure up to God's standards. I don't measure up to my own standards, right? Don't you disappoint yourself some days? I disappoint myself. Bible says there is not one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.10. Here we are walking down that Romans road to salvation. If we say that we have not sinned, 1 John 1, 8, we call God a liar and his truth is not in us. So we accept this, that we've sinned, but we, I'm not sure that we accept the fact that the world is the way it is because of human sin. The reason the world is so messed up is because we've sinned and the result is that we live in a fallen world. It's a broken planet. Everything has been injured and damaged and spoiled and corrupted in some way. And God created the world perfect, the apple of his eye, a paradise. And people just don't understand this. And they ask all the time, why is this happening? Why did this happen? And when they ask that, they just don't understand that the world, or maybe they don't remember 
that the world has fallen. We live in a fallen, broken planet, and this is not heaven. Now, I want to give us five dimensions or results of this reality. Uh, sin affects five areas, natural implications, physical implications, emotional implications, relational implications, and spiritual implications. First one, natural disasters. Nature doesn't always act in a rational, predictable way, does it? Sometimes it seems just very vicious and, and at the same time, you know, indiscriminate. It often acts in an ir irrational way. So people want to know, why was there a hurricane? Then someone is quick to theologize about it and say, well, you know, it struck that town because they were some bad people in that town, you know. And I always say, if, if God had lightning strike every place there was a bad person, the whole place would be charred, right? You can't always theologize about natural disasters, but the world is a broken place, not a perfect place. Romans 8.20 says that creation was subjected to frustration. It says that, frust that creation groans, awaiting for that day of redemption, when God will make this planet the way that he intended. But the natural world has fallen. There are deformities. There are disasters because the world is not as it should be. Then we come to physical decay. The physical de death and decay is because we live in a fallen planet. We're getting older. We're getting weaker. Believe me, kids, you are. The time will come when you will feel your age. You don't believe me now, but you will. There are no perfect bodies, regardless of what you see on TV. You know, on the magazines, there is such a thing called airbrush. It's not everything is like you see it. I used to have a six-pack. Now I've got a keg. Things change, don't they? There's a lot of gravity around here. It seems like things just want to fall down. Believe me, in time, you will experience that same thing. It's physical decay. Everything is falling. That states that uh, in, in physics, they call it the law of entropy. Everything in the universe is continuously decaying. The universe is gradually moving away. Okay? Totally contradicts what evolution says. Evolution says that everything is getting better every year, that, that the universe is fixing itself and coming together into perfection. And yet what they find now is that they know that the universe is, is scattering, is, is going out, it's decaying, it's dispersing. And we also have death. The Bible says that everyone dies because we all are related to Adam. That means that since we are humans and we are fallen, we will all die. Adam and Eve were forced out of the garden, remember, because if they stayed in the garden, they would have been allowed in their fallen state to eat of that tree that would give them eternal life. That, that would be too much of a punishment to be able to have to live in a fallen state for eternity. So God ran them out of the garden. God wanted them to be perfect, but... Since sin had ruined it, he did not want them to be bound in a fallen body forever. But God is saying that the day is coming when he will make a new heaven and a new earth. He says there will be no more death. The old, he says, will pass away. But we are not at that day. The third thing is emotional stress. We have emotional stress because of sin. We get stressed. We have anxiety because we live in a world filled with sin. Now, you know that most things don't live up to their hype. When have you bought anything that lived up to the advertising? We just, we we're become immune to this. We see something and it's advertised as the biggest and the best and you can't live without it. We know it's not. But, but when is anything going to live up to its hype? Most things are over-related. Historian Daniel Borston suggests that Americans suffer from an all too extravagant expectations, is what he says in his book called The Image. This is what he says. He says, we expect anything and everything. We expect the contradictory and the impossible. We expect compact cars which are spacious, luxurious cars which are economical. We expect to be rich and charitable, powerful and merciful, active and reflective, kind and competitive. We expect to eat and stay thin, to constantly be on the move and ever more neighborly, to go to a church of our choice 
and yet feel its guiding power over us to revere God and to be God. Never, he says, have people been more the masters of their environment, and yet never has a people felt more deceived and disappointed. For never has a people expected so much more than the world could offer. We do have unrealistic expectations most of the time. Uh, we expect to be young and wise, like we're born wise or something, or we expect to be paid high salaries and yet not have to work too much, or we expect to run around all week just feeling 10 minutes late all the time and then to have 15 minutes to relax and to be at peace and be content. It just doesn't work that way. We live under severe emotional stress. Most of them are caused by unrealistic expectations. As a pastor, I, I see this so often. I've officiated at so many weddings, and I see it happen at the wedding. Not every one, but often it does happen. Things like the color of the mints. Every little detail on some weddings is down to the smallest thing. Everything is planned out. The color of the mints and the ribbon on the, the things that tie up the mints. And for months and years, and some of you know what I mean, you did this. Uh, you, you, you plan all this stuff out. And then, poof, it's just you know gone in just a few minutes. Uh, one of the most extravagant weddings that I ever officiated at um, they had planned it. it. I mean, we had a full film crew. We had horse and carriage. It, attendance just wrapped everywhere, filled the church up with attendance. And, I mean, no money was spared. And after the whole thing is over, I never forget this. I was just a young pastor. But after the whole thing was over and the bride and the groom and I were kind of sequestered in the back behind the chancel waiting for the pictures to be taken and get rid of the people, get them out of there so we could take the pictures, and the bride looked at her watch, and I'm sure it was a watch that was bought for that day. Bought for that day, and she looked at it and she said, "22 minutes. I did all that for 22 minutes." I thought, "Wow." <laughs> I, I felt kind of sorry for her at that time, but her expectations were so huge, so unrealistic, you know. And here she had, uh, probably since she was a little girl, planned everything out, and it came down to 22 minutes, and she was disappointed. Things never happen the way that we plan them to happen because we're living in a world that's affected by sin. Disappointment and stress are part of the result. And then there's relational distance and discord. You notice that when Adam and Eve, back in that original story, when Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't just that it separated them from God, but it separated them from each other. But immediately, Adam blames God and the woman. He said, that woman that you gave me gave me the fruit. Okay, so Lord, it's really you gave me and the woman. That, it's not me, you know. So guys, I, you know, that was the last time a guy ever blamed anybody else or passed the buck around, I know. But we come by it naturally. But ma marriage problems all come down to, and relationship problems all come down to one word, sin. That's behind it all. You can analyze all you want. You can go to communication uh, courses and, and counseling, and all that stuff's great, but it will not fix the problem of the human sin. We either grow up or we grow apart. Those are the options. Either we learn how to be, um, learn not to be selfish or, and demand our way, or we grow apart. People say, oh, we're incompatible. Well, that's just another way of saying I'm mature and I want my way. Uh, she won't give me my way. He won't give me my way. If you want your way, you're going to have conflicts. Adam and Eve had real intimacy in the beginning. It, they were innocent. It says that they were naked. And little kids snicker at this. You know, what, what God isn't saying is just that they're physically naked, over, well, though they were, but he's saying that they were vulnerable to each other. They were open with each other. They had no secrets. Uh, they were going in the same direction. Um, they had no baggage, no bad history, no sin. They had no code words to use to make the other one mad. You know what I mean. They were naked before each other, vulnerable, unashamed. But once that they sin, then they try to cover that nakedness. Remember, and they go out and it says that, that suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness, so they strung fig leaves together to cover themselves. And they were not suddenly modest. They... They began hiding from each other because of sin. Humans, uh, we do this 
um, so well. Uh, we don't want anyone to know who we really are. Um, we, we long for intimacy, but, and we search for someone to love me, to take me as I am, but, but we won't show them who we really are. That's part of the game, is to hide that stuff. We cover it up. We don't let them in. And why? Well, because of shame, because of guilt. So here's a question. Only question I think I give on this, on this uh, message today, what's your fig leaf? We might stop and think about that for a while. Some of us cover up with anger. Some people get too close and we get mad. It scares them and they run away. Others of us go and hide. You know, we say, I need some alone time. Some of us just are, are too busy to ever talk to anybody. You know, if someone gets close to us, I, I just got too much stuff to do. I'm sorry, I can't sit down today and talk. Some of us hide in silence. It's just simply will not tell anyone what's going on. And sin is what is behind that. God warned Cain, sin is waiting at the door to strike. What a, what a neat phrase. Sin is waiting. Do the right thing, he says. God tells Cain. God says, do the right thing, and yet we know that that's not an easy commandment because we live in a world where doing the wrong thing has become normalized. This, this is what our world is like. Now, the last one is spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness is a result of sin in the world as well. Sin leaves a hole in us. St. Augustine said, Lord, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. We were made by God for God, and until we make that connection, we're going to be looking and running and always discontent, and sin leaves that hole in us until God drives out the darkness left by sin, the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. We are blind. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But people who are unspiritual don't accept the things from God's Spirit. They are foolishness to them and cannot and can't be understood because they can only be comprehended in a spiritual way. Now, if, you, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, you know that what he's talking about. Suddenly, just, just things come to light. Well, when I was born again, uh, I, th I thought people had, someone had changed the Bible. I said, what new translation is this? is this? Because these things are life to me. And when I was a little child, they were just stories. And now all of a sudden, they're, they're written to me. But when the Holy Spirit is in you, he gives you those eyes. Suddenly you begin to understand his word. You get spiritual eyes. The darkness in this world is so pervasive that our minds are darkened and we do not understand the things of God until the new creation comes and the darkness is overcome with light. Well, you're going, Don, you're not very encouraging today. You really weren't that funny today. I know. Maybe I should have had a few more jokes in there. Um, there's no great philosophical dilemma about this. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing really to decide. The reason that the world stinks is because there's sin in the world, and we've each got a part in that. We can't blame anybody else. But listen, there's some good news in the midst of Larry's brother uh, getting uh, his new bedroom. Uh, Jeremiah the prophet. I want to throw this in here. Here's a, here's a word that we sing this uh, a lot, but I don't know if I've ever used this before. It's from a book you probably can't even find in the Bible, Lamentations. Hmm. Uh, it's by Jeremiah is the author, and Jeremiah the prophet wrote these words, and you'll recognize the hymn as we go through this. He says, The memory of my suffering and homelessness is bitterness and poison. In other words, the world is stunk. It's been painful for me. He says, I can't help but remember and am depressed. I call all this to mind, therefore I will wait. Certainly the faithful love of the Lord hasn't ended. Certainly God's compassion isn't through. They are renewed every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Well, that would make a good hymn, wouldn't it? Great is your faithfulness, O God, new every morning. Then verse 24, he says, I think the Lord is my portion, therefore I'll wait for him. Uh, and I, I put on the slide here the way the message uh, inter interprets that 
is the message says in the last phrase, Lord, you are all I need. Lord, you are all I need. You're my portion. You're all I need. Now, now that, friends, is the antidote to the sin that's in this world. Is that God is all that we need. Well, we often run with a lot of other antidotes to the problem of, of the way that I'm feeling or my suffering. But um, all the circumstances that come at us, but when we trust in God, that God is all I need, I can depend upon you, as the prophet says, then we've, we, we've come to a place where the world's circumstances are below us, not above us. God is in control of this world. When we wrestle with the evil of the world, with injustice that, that falls on so many, we remember that God is in control and that the story is not over. Don't forget that today, friends. That the story is not over. We're just in the midst of the story. We hope we're close to the end of the story. But the story is still here. God is at work using even the evil and the injustice to bring us to him. Most of us have had that experience where it was our sin that drove us back to God. It was, it was the injustice perhaps that was done against us by someone else that made us yearn for God again and turn us around. God is at work, even using the evil and the injustice to bring about a new day. So when you think about the evil and the injustice of the pain that so many endure, remember that God is not done. Why does he wait? Why, why not now? Why not now be the day when he makes a new heaven and a new earth? Why not now be the day when we are fully cleansed of all sin and sanctified and made holy in him? Why not today? Well, because God is waiting. 2 Peter 3, 9. I'm so, ga I'm so glad that God put this in the Bible. It says, The Lord isn't slow to keep his promise, as some think of slowness, but he is patient toward you not wanting anyone to perish, but all to change their hearts and lives. Now change your hearts and my lives. And the NIV and King James and other translation is just simply the word repent. We know what that means. God is not slow. He's just waiting. He wants more. God is waiting for people to wake up. God is waiting for me and you to turn to him. Perhaps God is waiting for the people in our nation to turn to him. And the world to turn to him. America is getting behind when it comes to righteousness. Other nations in Africa and China and many of the third world nations are far ahead of us in kingdom work. And we languish with what we have so much of the world. And he says, wake up. We cry for justice and we, we, we cry for an end to war. And God says, wake up. Return to me. You know... We must respond. I think the biggest mistake that we can make is to blame God for what God did not do. We've seen so much suffering, and when God sees suffering, God cries. We, we think that, that it makes us upset. We, we see something happen to a parent with a child or someone that loses someone uh, prematurely, and, and, and we cry about that. And we go, why? Well, well God is crying too. We cry, we grieve because we have God's emotions. God grieves over the sin in this world too. And we are so prone to run everywhere and every place else except to God. And that's, that's where we have to come. We have to respond. He says that he knows the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. He knows the breath that's in our lungs. There's nothing hidden from his heart. He knows who we are. He knows what it is that's put us in this place. And he waits for us to come to the place where we say, God, you are all that I need. I wonder if we could do something I hadn't planned here. Uh, Jeremy, could you go to the end of the last slide on that song, Like a Child? Putting him on the spot. Okay. I want to just, we were singing this. I thought, wow. Uh, the, the whole thing about the song was, you know, what we could do if we had faith like a child. Look at these words together, friends. They say that love can heal the broken. They say that hope can make you see. They say that faith can find a Savior if you would 
follow and believe with faith like a child. Did you ever stop to think of the fact that if there were no sin in the world, if the world were perfect, we would have no reason for faith whatsoever? And faith is what binds us to God. Faith is what opens up the world or opens up our hearts to God. Love can heal the broken. Love can, hope can make you see. Faith can find a Savior if you would follow and believe with faith like a child. Let, let's sit in a moment with that. As deep cries out 